Welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us today for the roundtable Ukrainian studies under attack. Uh, my name is Mark Andrejcik and I have been administrator of the Ukrainian studies program here at the Harriman Institute Columbia University for the past 15 years. Uh, since the 90s, our program has been presenting courses and organizing lectures and conferences along various avenues of Ukraine studies. And many of these academic initiatives involved the participation of scholars and other intellectuals uh, from Ukraine. Uh, these women and men are in our minds these days uh, as we pray for the country. Our event today, Ukrainian Studies Under Attack, features a distinguished panel of scholars who will discuss the ways that by first claiming that Ukraine does not exist, and then by attacking the country, Putin is also attacking the field of Ukrainian studies, which for decades has taught and published on Ukraine and has striven to include the country as a subject of analysis at academic forums throughout the world. Today's event uh, will run from uh, noon till 1.30 p.m. Uh, as for the format, we'll have four presentations. Uh, I will introduce each uh, presenter before they present. This will be followed by a discussion among them. And then we will open up the floor to questions from the public. Uh, in order to pose questions to our speakers, please submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A tab and I will read it to them. If you are on YouTube, then please transfer over to there to post your questions. Uh, right before we get to, uh, to the introductions, I just have two quick notes I want to mention. Uh, this Friday at 11 a.m., uh, uh, so Friday, March 1st, 11 a.m., online, we have an, an event at Harem entitled What's Next? Experts Respond to Russia's Invasion of Ukraine. So please tune in if you can then. Um, and then I was asked, just to briefly read this announcement. Help support the Digital Humanities Interest Group from Purdue University in their intervention to secure Ukrainian cultural heritage materials during this war. A sign up link for Saturdays, that is March 5th's data rescue session is available in the chat. We will begin. Um, and I'll be just reading shortened bios in the interest of time. Please uh, refer to our website for complete uh, bios of our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Valentina Izmileva. She is professor of Slavic literatures and culture and is the director of the Harriman Institute of Columbia University. Please, Valentina. Thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you all. Um, my co-panelists for responding so enthusiastically and on such a short notice to Harriman's emergency panel on this important topic. I will begin with a statement that might not be obvious to everybody. The war on Ukraine is a war over control of historical memory. Putin's public pronouncements before he launched an attack on sovereign Ukraine last week attempted to rhetorically obliterate Ukrainian history, cultural legacy, and the right to Ukrainian language and literature, in fact, to anything Ukrainian to exist as separate from Russia. And then he ordered his army to make this macabre fantasy a reality by fire and blood. To us historians who study Ukraine and its cultural heritage, this brutal theft of history in plain sight in front of the entire world poses a double challenge. First, we are called by the urgency and gravity of the moment to have a swift response in defense of the historical truth and publicly expose this grand historical larceny for the crime that it is. The war that is raging now in Ukraine is about control of Ukraine's historical past as much as it is about Ukrainian future. And we are all called to be volunteers in this war. Second, no less important, we have the responsibility to make public the history of this theft because the theft is not new and Russia has been a repeated offender in the same crime. What are the logic and the motives behind it 
understanding the history of Russia's obsession with Ukrainian history and the desire to possess it holds the key to understanding much of the current tragic events. At the heart of it is Kyiv. I dare say that from the start, the goal of Putin has been nothing less than possessive, possessing Kyiv and reclaiming it together with the legacy of Kiev and Rus for the new Russian empire he wants to build. Moscow has a long-standing anxiety vis-a-vis Kyiv, which is not only the more ancient city, but commands much heftier symbolic capital as the mother of all Russian cities and the sacred heart of all roots. It all hinges on events at the end of the 10th century, more than a hundred years before Moscow was even founded, when the Kievan prince Volodymyr accepted Christianity from Byzantium and made his capital the quote unquote baptismal font for all um, Eastern Slavs. The rise of Muscovy against the backdrop drop of the Mongol Tatar invasion of Rus and the sack of Kiev in 1240. Together with the fall of Constantinople several centuries later, opened unprecedented opportunities to Moscow rulers. As the only remaining Orthodox sovereign state, Muscovy could now vie for the Byzantine imperial legacy, including the title Basileus, Tsar, for the Moscow Grand Prince. The ideology of Moscow, the third Rome, first articulated in the early 16th century, claimed a double blessing for the ruler of Moscow, not only as heir to Roman imperial power, but also to the messianic blessing of Christ the King, personally responsible for the salvation of humankind at the time of the apocalypse. Moscow's only link to Constantinople and to this imperial double blessing, however, was Kyiv. And hence the utility of the Kievan past for the czars of Moscow increased exponentially. And a massive campaign was launched for appropriating this past, which was not finalized until 1686 when Moscow annexed Kiev. Finally, the grand theft of Kievan history was justified and legalized through the appropriation of Kievan geography. Sounds familiar? It should. This imperial solution to Moscow's problem remained more or less in effect throughout the Soviet period. But in 1991, the situation radically changed when Kyiv became the capital of a new sovereign state of Ukraine and the legitimacy of Russia's claim to the Kievan legacy with all its symbolic power evaporated overnight. The history which Russia had stolen long ago was now lost. And if it were ever to be recuperated, Russia needed to re-steal it. This is exactly what Putin has been doing for the last decade. First rhetorically, then through more aggressive actions like the kidnapping of the Kievan Prince Volodymyr in the form of his gigantic Moscow monument, a monument, mind you, to the founder of the Russian state, and now through an all out war. Our late colleague, Karen DeWisha, advanced an influential vision of Putin's role as kleptocracy. We have to recognize today that Putin's kleptocracy extends far beyond material wealth and familiar forms of legalized criminality are employed also to appropriate history for the gain of the ruling clique. And the damage of that organized state criminality is much more devastating than the crimes, the criminal expropriation of money and property. And one last thought, this time much closer to whom? When our educational programs are not cognizant of these ideological manipulations of history, when these programs ignore or misinterpret these thefts, we too become complicit in Putin's kleptocracy. So teaching today the literary and cultural heritage of Kiev and Rus as old Russian literature, to give one example from my own discipline, makes us directly complicit in Putin's agenda 
participants on in the war on the wrong side. I would like to have a conversation about that and about the terrifying force of disciplinary inertia, about the way our audiences, our students, our colleagues have been trained to respond and recognize these labels, Russian, and to resist their placement. So I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina. Uh... Our next speaker is Frank Sisson. Uh, Frank is director of the Peter Yatsik Center for Ukraine Historical Research at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. He is professor in the Department of History, Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Alberta. And he is editor in chief of the Hrushevsky Translation Project, which is the English translation of the multi-volume History of Ukraine Rus. Uh, Frank. Thank you. My basic thesis will be that there is a well-developed field of Ukrainian studies uh, that frequently uh, many scholars, including in North America, do not avail themselves of the achievements of that field, and that the field has a history that can teach us much about the relationships between politics and scholarship. Uh, and in that, the field developed with considerable difficulties. I'll only go back to 1863, although much of my work goes much earlier than that. Uh, that was the year when Ukrainians tried to put out a translation of a Bible in modern Ukrainian. Uh, and Russian censorship of the Russian empire declared that such a language never existed, does not exist, and will not exist. And that I think is really indicative then of telling us uh, its situation. By 1876, there were new bans on Ukrainian, and one of the major scholars of that day, Mikhailo Drahomanov, had to go into exile to continue his scholarship in Western, Western Europe. And that's another part of the story of Ukrainian scholarship, how many times it was driven out of the Ukrainian territories. Fortunately for Ukrainian scholarship, Ukrainians also existed in the Habsburg monarchy, in Austria and Galicia, and at a time, not too frequent, but one that did occur when Poles and Ukrainians tried to come to a compromise in Galicia. Uh, there were, was, were created chairs in Ukrainian studies at the university in Lviv. And Mikhail Rushevsky left the Russian empire to go to the Austrian empire to take over the leadership of the Shevchenko Scientific Society, which he turned into a fantastic civil society academy of sciences and to write his great history. Also in those years between 1894 and 1914, a modern Ukrainian scholarly language was developed that could not be developed in the Russian empire because of those bans. This explains to a great degree how scholarship and study of Ukraine contributed to the great changes after the breakdown of World War I and the revolutions in Eastern Europe and explained why many Ukrainians were enlisted in trying to establish Ukrainian state. They were not successful in the end in doing so, but they left behind a considerable tradition. In 1918, under the Hetman Skoropadsky, a Ukrainian Academy of Sciences was established in the city of Kiev, in the capital. This presented great problems for many Soviets later on who found this an inconvenient year and an inconvenient regime to have done this. And in 1919, the Ukrainian National Republic and Kamenets Podilsky established a Ukrainian university. These could not be dreamed of before the First World War in either the Russian Empire or the Austrian Empire. There are many in Soviet history in particular, uh, and as well as Putin with his recent ascription of Ukraine to Lenin, who like to date this later and uh, ignore this early period and the importance of the scholarship and institutions that to many, do, many ways explain why the Soviets compromised in the formation of the Soviet Union, uh, why it was created, and why a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic was permitted, even though twice the Bolsheviks were driven out of Ukraine during the Russian Civil War. The interwar period was one in which Ukrainian scholarship developed in various areas in different ways. There were, in those territories that fell to the Polish state, at least a promise initially that a Ukrainian university could be established in Lviv. 
And regrettably, Polish regimes never permitted that university to be established. And therefore, Ukrainian society continued to want uh, and to strive for a university. In the 1920s, the Soviet Union went on a policy of indigenization, which we have had much described of late and is very important, and allowed for the development of a Soviet Ukrainian culture. But when that culture got out of hand and got too independent at the end of the 1920s, and even influenced Ukrainian communists to think in Ukrainian categories, of course, Stalin had a way of decimating that culture. And what is very important to remember is the first trials in Ukraine begin in 1929, 1930, and they are done against the so-called League for the Liberation of Ukraine, and they attack the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church, not for its religious aspects, but as a nationalist institution. And so Ukrainian scholarship was destroyed. To a considerable degree, it continued on because of the benefic beneficence and wisdom of Thomas Masaryk, who financed Ukrainian academic institutions, including the Ukrainian Free University in Prague, which flourished in the 1920s and 30s, and to this day exists, moved once again because of political, uh, political exigencies of World War II, and now in the city of Munich is the oldest private university in Europe today. All of that meant that when uh, World War II decimated the old continent and so many scholars moved to North America, they had to begin again in forming scholarly traditions. And here Columbia University and what was to become the Harriman Institute play a tremendous role. In the time of Philip Mosley and above all Clarence Manning who wrote many popular works on Ukraine that many learned their first, who could read English, their first way of reaching into the Ukrainian past. Uh, it is a tradition that continued at Columbia above all because Professor George Shevardov, one of the most brilliant scholars, literary specialists and minds certainly uh, that I have ever encountered in my life was a professor uh, in the Department of Slavic Languages at Columbia. But in general, North America was under a very Russocentric view of both the past of Ukraine and even the existence of a Ukrainian language was doubted by what might call elements of the more nationalist Russian trained, uh, Russian trained academia. So it was in the 1950s that Ukrainian students at Columbia began raising funds for a chair in Ukrainian studies. In that end, that chair in the Ukrainian studies fund went to Harvard University in 1968. And there there was formed both uh, three chairs in Ukrainian studies and a scholarly institute. I think it was the best way Ukrainians could have responded to what they saw was a war going on a war going on when particularly by 1970, there were new attacks on Ukrainian culture in Soviet Ukraine. And therefore that existence was extremely important. It produced journals like Harvard Ukrainian Studies, one of the classic journals of the study of very early periods, very far from contemporary politics. And I might say when the millennium of Christianity came in 1988, uh, that the Harvard Institute and above all those associated with it produced some of the finest scholarship dealing with early Slavic culture and the most wonderful international conference in Ravenna that had, I think we can be totally superlative as an international event. In other words, Harvard went up against a whole series of uh, foes, including at that time the organized Moscow Patriarchate and the Soviet Union, and was able to produce something at such a level. So there was in a way a war for the past. In Canada, because of the large number of Ukrainians existing in, in through particularly Western provinces, when multiculturalism came into Canada in the 1970s, Ukrainians led the way, arguing that they understood that they were part of Canada, but their language and culture should be part of it. But um, to a great degree, their activity came because unlike other groups, they could not turn to a mother country. They were cut off from that country and the source of that culture. And so it made them particularly tenacious in it. The Institute in Edmonton formed uh, a Encyclopedia of Ukraine. 
which first was published in five volumes that were a bestseller in academia of its time, huge volumes that came out and came out just as Ukraine became independent, extremely important, and now is available online. So all of those uh, scholars who turn to alternative facts instead of uh, more factual material, I frequently can say, don't bother to call me or ask me. You just Google, just, just go to get online. You can get an article that can give you some census statistics or what you need. And that institute also ran conferences dealing with Ukrainian Russian, Ukrainian Jewish, Ukrainian Polish, Ukrainian German relations in days when no one could dream there would be an independent Ukrainian state. I might say of all of that, we must remember that looking from the points of view of either Edmonton or Cambridge or New York, one could only uh, jealously assume uh, that one should someday have what colleagues in Russian studies could have, that is ability to go there and study archives and manuscripts. I was a number of times turned down by the Soviet authorities and today can tell you I have my KGB file records and I even have data now that tells me I as a Ukrainian bourgeois nationalist and I assure you I was quite poor at that time. Uh, so I would have aspired to bourgeois status. Uh, was unacceptable to the Soviet authorities. We were not allowed, many of us, into archives and, 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 and because of that, we often suffered in academia. But I would say, if I look now at the field after many years of practice, above all, what the Ukrainian example tells us is that academics should not be too smug. There is something about an academic world that closes one off. One does not like, wish to be challenged, and God forbid we should admit we don't know something. Uh, some of my colleagues, and I had one of my, my most precious one, Mark Van Hagen, with whom I taught a course, was the exact opposite. And the first time he would hear of something new, he, he, his eyes would glisten and, and he would want to discuss it with you. Very rare in the field. But where I see that above all is in the study of the great famine in Ukraine and the whole of the war where people outside of academia published books of oral history in the early 1950s, written down. And because the books were named things like the Black Deeds of the Kremlin, many scholars did not want to listen to biased emigres. The bias these people had is that they were survivors of, of a horrible genocide. And they wanted to tell their stories as many Armenians wanted to tell their stories as many survivors of the Holocaust, Jewish, Roman, and others wanted to tell their stories. But Soviet studies had no place for them for a long time. Indeed, had the Ukrainians not established these academic institutions, and it was one of the great successes of the Harvard Ukrainian Institute that they got Robert Conquest to write then the first academic study in the 1980s of an event that had occurred in 1933 that the breakthrough occurred. But academia, academia does not accept easily. One should not accept a book. One should be critical of testimony. And all of this is part of what academics do. But one should not exclude a priori the sources that come to it. And I feel too many of our colleagues in Russian and Soviet studies somehow still have those blinders, very hard to get through. And that's one of the things that made it possible for Putin to espouse his case in many circles quite unquestioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Summary of Ukrainian studies in such a short time, but so many important um, facts there. Uh, our next speaker is Rory Finin. Uh, he is University Associate Professor of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Cambridge. He is the founding director of Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, former head of the Department of Slavonic Studies, and the former chair of the Cambridge Committee for Russian and East European Studies. Please, Rory. Thanks, Marco. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thanks to Valentina, thanks Marco, um, thanks to everyone at the Harriman Institute for organizing this event. Um, I have such fond personal and uh, professional ties to the Harriman Institute, to Columbia University, to you all. Um, 
and I just, uh, you want to honor that at the outset and also say as, as Marco did earlier and Valentina and Frank as well, that, and I think every moment of our um, appearance here today is full of uh, solidarity, connection and love to uh, everyone in Ukraine, especially those scholars um, and students who are um, under such uh, attack right now. So uh, we, we all keep them in our, in our, in our, in our uh, hearts right now. Um, <clears throat> I, I first want to say very briefly, um, I get this question, I'm sure everyone's getting this question all the time, how to be helpful. So um, I, I do want to encourage everyone, of course, to, to look for ways to, to give to Ukrainian organizations that are supporting um, uh, people right now, um, uh, leading uh, the defense uh, of Ukraine. And also if anybody is tuning in from the United Kingdom to call MPs, press MPs to offer visas, um, uh, to Ukrainians to end restrictions to visas. It's a, it's a big problem here in the UK that we need to address. So if anyone's out there, please um, um, stay active. Uh, that's what we're doing here in the UK. So um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Valentina mentioned earlier is not only the physical violence in this war, but the epistemic violence uh, that is attendant to it. Um, and I think we might speak of Ukrainian studies since 1991 as a field that has been dogged by an epistemological problem because like nature knowledge <clears throat> knowledge should abhor a vacuum that is uh, academic research should gravitate to big unknown complex things but um, if this war is teaching us anything at all it's that ukraine still rem remains this terra malacognita that is it's it's been large uh, it's large it's diverse um, but it's understudied and badly understood we could see this even in some of the remarkable expressions of surprise that Ukrainians would defend their country, um, some of the prognostications that Kyiv would fall fairly quickly. Um, this is part of a broader problem that we need to address. This is why I'm so pleased the Herman Institute has organized this session because we all need to understand how um, the defense of Ukraine will continue. Um, and if we're not aware of how strong and how um, substantial that defense will be, we're making huge geostrategic geopolitical error ourselves analytically. So we need to confront that right now. And in terms of understanding the field of Ukrainian studies since 1991, I often actually speak to my students about this um, by way of an interdisciplinary analogy. So uh, um, imagine a physicist in 1991 who um, discovers in her laboratory a new particle the largest of its kind in a particular system. And she notices that this particle affects the movement and trajectory of its neighbors. It sits at the system's nexus. But then this physicist notice, notices something even more astounding. And that is that the particle is held together in a peculiar way. So most other particles have at least one particular feature that causes them to cohere. But this particle doesn't. Now imagine leagues of other physicists who shrug their shoulders and return to business as usual. It's really hard to imagine that, but sadly that has been the story of Ukrainian studies um, in some sectors, in some areas. I think uh, Mar uh, Frank is exactly right that uh, Columbia is a wonderful exception um, among, among others as well. But in European higher education, we can see it um, that effectively um, there has been this failure to see Ukraine, failure to invest Ukrainians with their their own agency, to listen to their voices, to understand their aspirations um, and ideas for their, for their country and for their culture. After all, he, sitting here in Great Britain, I have to sometimes remind people that uh, Ukraine is the largest country by territory within um, the European continent. And it's bound together not by one language or one church or one ethnicity um, or even one historical inheritance. Um, and at the institutional level, the academy has largely shrugged its shoulders in response um, to Ukraine's emergence as an independent state in 1991. It tends not to recognize the country and its people as an official object of knowledge. So um, this is instead perpetuated an outbreak of what we might call reverse hallucination, a condition of not seeing what is there with respect to Ukraine. So for many, many months, as we talked about Russian forces amassing along Europe's, uh, along uh, Ukraine's eastern border, to the casual British observer, they might as well have been poised to invade a black hole. And that, that is something we have to take great stock of here. 30 years of, uh, I think, scholarly failure, um, and it has to end. So uh, I do not, however, want to say that this problem exists um, 
without valiant efforts actually on the part of a number of scholars here in Europe, um, in Germany, in Italy. Um, it exists despite the activity of the Ukrainian Free University in Munich uh, with which uh, many of us have ties. Uh, the curricular initiatives of the Ukrainikum summer school in Greifswald, for instance, um, similar initiatives in Paris. But going back to what Frank said at the start, I think the problem exists because of a persistent failure in the academy to interrogate the value bound choices of research in area studies and a problem in which we are unable to disentangle intellectual merit from often very stale perceptions of political power. So the problem has been this prevailing logic by which might is not only right, but red. So this has been abundantly clear to us in Ukrainian studies, Baltic studies, African studies, and so on. And less clear has been our collective response. Um, and, and so I, I'm really proud that Harriman has put this session together so we can talk about um, the response going forward, what we're going to do about the conditions um, in which Ukrainian studies became a field uh, under attack. And I thought what I could do maybe is talk about a specific example in which this blindness toward Ukraine has led to a series of, uh, I think, disastrous analytical failures. And to speak specifically about the failure of acknowledging the legacy of empire and settler colonialism in particular in the Ukrainian lands and even more specifically in Crimea. Settler colonialism, uh, colonialism is a defining historical political phenomenon that is too often swept under the academic rug and ignored in political discourse uh, with respect to uh, Ukraine and, and e even beyond it. And to speak about Crimea is to acknowledge that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the peninsula was widely understood as this land of three alienations. So it was seen as a home to returning Crimean Tatars who had been deported by Stalin in 1944, who endured a great deal of, of discrimination at the, lands, uh, at the hands of um, local authorities. It was a, a home to ethnic Ukrainians who were coming to grips after 1991 with their uh, position as a titular group of a newly independent state. And it was also understood as a home to politically and culturally dominant ethnic Russians who were expressing, we might say, an insecure nationalism aligned less with Kyiv than with this collapse imperium. So what I'm trying to get at here is that this symmetrical triadic conceptualization of Crimean society, which is a generalization that flattens other variations too, it tended to predominate in our analysis of the politics and society of post-Soviet Crimea, but it almost completely ignores the hierarchies, the nested post-colonialisms that determine the interrelationships of all of these sides. So in our analytical discourse, particularly with respect to Crimea, we rarely made reference to a colonial framework at all. And so this was a, a very troubling silence that leads us, I think, directly to 2014. Because after 1991, like much of former Soviet territory, particularly Ukraine, Crimea was a site of decolonization. It was, it was uh, in a place of transition where the scaffolding of imperialism was being dismantled and remade with a view to the construction of a liberal democratic state. Now in our field, uh, and particularly in, in uh, let's say Sovietology, we've made a lot of the term empire vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union. But I think the, the, the question of the wholesale application of such a complex contested term is too often a distraction. And what Crimea uh, and much of Ukraine experienced after um, the Second World War in particular were various projects of settler colonialism. So looking at Crimea once again, more specifically Stalin uh, ethnically cleansed an, entirely, an entire indigenous people from the peninsula. So roughly 20% of the population at the time. Um, the Soviet regime presided over an erasure of their material and symbolic traces and a complete rewriting of their history. So this should sound familiar to us. Stalin then replaced them with tens of thousands of Russians and Ukrainians transplanted from outside the peninsula. This is what I call a, a program of ethnic cloning that comes after ethnic cleansing. So we didn't learn enough from these things. We didn't confront them enough. We didn't speak about them clearly in these terms. And this has led, I think, to this militarization of consciousness in places like Crimea. Um, I, I often refer to uh, the work of Albert Memmi, who wrote, I think, very eloquently about um, the, the, what the system of colonial um, regimes do to people. Um, that is, 
they aggressively attempt to erase various colonized natives from our view. Um, when we think about uh, Vladimir Putin's deranged speech of last uh, Monday, I think it was, um, it was an attempt to condemn these colonized natives, right, Ukrainians, and dismiss them, as Memi would put it, from the mind. So um, these are things we have to confront. The legacy and the framework of colonization and colonialism is really important for us to unpack and confront. Even if it's 30 years too late, we have to do it. Because as Memi writes, colonization distorts relationships. Um, and it corrupts both the colonizers and the colonized. And I think our prevailing reading of, let's say, post-Soviet Crimean politics, according to this inter-ethnic uh, paradigm, has really neglected to account adequately, I think, for the structural echoes of this colonial system. Um, and this has had disastrous, as I mentioned, uh, geopolitical consequences. It had practical consequences too. That is, we didn't learn enough from it um, and weren't able to apply various historical parallels to learn from other cases of settler colonialism around the world. So to learn from the cases of the United States to Australia, where we could have understood the need to, let's say, foreground the use of um, tested mechanisms of policies of reparations, right? Official apologies, the importance of truth commissions, uh, the importance of electoral quotas. These things were just never brought into our analysis sufficiently, I think. Um, Ukraine as a state never had a coherent strategy for its own decolonization, certainly didn't have it for Crimea. And I think uh, the blindness to this problem the blindness to this history and legacy of settler colonialism is part of the reason why. And the blindness also, by the way, prevented us from noting that in 2014, the Russian Federation became not only the first European country since the Second World War to seize another European country's uh, territory by force, but it was also the first successor of a modern empire to take back a former uh, colonial possession. So what I would hope out of this is that uh, we come to grips with our failings um, we come to grips with what we haven't known. I love the example that Frank just offered of, of uh, our great friend and dear friend, um, Mark von Hagen, who is curious, never smug, and that we take stock of how we got here, how we were all involved to a degree in the failings to see how this legacy of empire, the struggles of decolonization that we never called out explicitly, had led us to a position to not understand the challenges that Ukrainians and others have faced particularly in the face of resurgent uh, Moscow that, as Memi put it, is seeking to essentially drive the colonized out of, uh, out of one's mind by force. So I'll leave my comments there. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Rory, uh, for your presentation. Uh, our final speaker is Vito Susak, uh, who is an art historian, a curator, and an expert for the Ukrainian Cultural Foundation at the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. Uh, Vita. Thank you. So, dear Valentina, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. As an art historian yeah, who wrote a book about Ukrainian artists in Paris, who deals with Ukrainian avant-gardists, what can I say here? I will try. I had to listen to this hour long speech by Putin to prepare to, for this talk. It was difficult. The old familiar phrase was in my head, life is what you tell about it. And history is what you narrate. What facts are chosen, who is brought to the forefront, who is forgotten, and when the story begins. Listen to Putin. I thought about the speechwriter who prepared the text, about the historians who consulted him. I studied in St. Petersburg and defended my dissertation in Moscow in the, late, in the late 90s. I admired the breadth of knowledge of Russian intellectual, their nostalgia for the great Russia and their sadness about the collapse of the Soviet Union was understandable for, for me. They needed time to cope with the collapse of their own imperial ambitions. Most of them are peaceful bookworms who love dodging into history, art history, and glorifying Russia past. 
in principle. This is what the hum, 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 humanists of every country do for their people. But it, this becomes dangerous when the past is imperial. Putin and his entourage use beautiful movies and heroic books to restore Russia's greatness at the cost of the war. You can, you can just remember this Sakura film, Russian Ark of 2002. Let psychologists, not historians, deal with concept of greatness. I want to talk about the responsibility of the Russian intelligentsia for what is happening. This is not an acquisition, but this need to be stated. And all the scholars of Slavic, Russian and post-Soviet studies at the European and American and even Japan University also need to understand this. I will use example for my field, such a case study. The two volume Encyclopedia of the Russian Avant-Garde edited by Andrei Sarabyanov and Vasily Rakitin published in 2013. I find this book in uh, Basel uh, in Bibliothek uh, Library of University of Basel. So everyone is there, not only Malevich, Archipenko, Burluk, and Alexandra Ekstern, Sonia Delaunay, but also Mikhail Bujchuk, Alexander Bahamazov, Sofia Boudouin de Courtenay. This can be argued very well. Artists who were active within the borders of the Russian Empire and the URSS during the avant-garde period. Editor pick, picked them all, covered them all with one big blanket. My colleagues, Ukrainian art historian, wrote text for the, this encyclopedia, hoping that the Ukrainian contribution would be better seen this way. They didn't see, they ate it up. It was a shock to me when in the text written by Sarabyanov about Alexa Hryshchenko, I saw no reference to his memories Ukraine of my blue, day, blue, blue days, Ukraine de mes de mes jours bleus. Not once did the Russian scholar use the adjective Ukrainian. The last sentence, he had the close contacts with Ukrainian diaspora. And place of birth, no, I, I, I would like underline, Krolevets, today, Sumy region, no country indication, 2013. Now, the translation of this edition into English is been prepared. Last year, I was approached, approached by publishers with a proposal to write for this edition an article entitled Russian Avant-Garde in the Museum, Museums of Ukraine. And which artists are you referring to? We don't have Filonov, Rozanova, Matyushin, and Guro, unfortunately. We don't have Kandinsky who grow up, grow up in Odessa, is it? Archipenko, Burluk Brothers, Malevich, Hryshchenko, Baranov, Rosine, they are born, grew up and received their primary artistic education in Kyiv and Odessa. I remember these facts were a big revelation for a teacher of Russian culture at Columbia University during my book presentation in the Harriman Institute in 2010. I declined. I read yesterday on Valery Pekar Facebook page, uh, he is a businessman and public figure in Kiev, an exact definition of our academic field of action. It is a semantic war, a war of concepts. Pekar quoted the chief of staff of the Putin executive office, Anton Vaino, as saying that, I quote, this is a war for the right to give phenomena and events names. This is the highest level of warfare. He's right. Putin said that Lenin created modern Ukraine, that today Ukraine has engaged in decommunization. So let's bring it to an end, the Russian leader ironically remarked on February 21. On February 24, it became clear what he meant. Bombing Russian people with notions of a great Russia, of the Ukraine created by the communists, he began to bomb Ukraine. Russia transformed from Third Rome to Third Reich. I quote Pekar again, 
we live in a time of postmodernity, and postmodernity gives us a strong instrument of defense in the semantic war, the construction. No worse than javelin. The aggressors imposes his narratives on us. There was no Ukraine, and they burn up like Russian gasoline trucks in the fire of the construction. It seems to me that all department of all East European, post-Soviet, Slavic studies in European and American universities will have to impose a moratorium on the study of Russian imperial subjects, even if there is a desire to show this or that narrative objective. It is like with Nazism in Germany. And the Russian society has to get over it to recover. Regarding the Ukrainian study in Europe and America, they are not mm, the construction flames. Yet, they are separate small fire. In America and Canada, they are burning for a long time, quite a long time. In Europe, they are started recently. I'll give you the example of Switzerland. At the University of St. Gallen, under the direction of Professor Ulrich Schmidt, the Ukrainian regionalism project was launched in 2012 and it is ongoing. The University of Basel has the initiative Ukrainian Research in Switzerland, URIS led by Professor Benjamin Schenk since 2016. They invite Ukrainian scholars in the area of history, social, political study to teach one semester. The University of Geneva implemented a three years project, shared, shared histories, divided memories, Russia, Poland, Poland, Ukraine, headed by Professor Corinne Amasher. They didn't really figure it out. It's so complicated as we know, but they showed it. It's not enough. And of course, what is happening now will give new impetus. There is another problem. Every national study, not just Ukrainian ones, resembles a reservation, a very narrow circle of audience. If Poles and Ukrainians can still say something about each other, other peoples are terra incognita. It seems to me that one of the way out is the approach to other cultures, neighbors and distant ones, comparative studies. Led in the form of separate special courses or just one lecture for Germanists, future specialists in Spanish, Italian, English literature, for historians not only of Eastern Europe, but also of Europe, Asia, and both of America. Of course, we need to talk about Staras Shevchenko, the Ukrainian Hohel and Lesya Ukrainka. But we also need to talk about Zabushka, Andruhovic, Jadan. For example, what is the difference between them and Michel Uelbeck or Cormac McCarthy? There are already many specialists in Ukraine and abroad who are fluent in English. Not Ukrainian programs, but general departments need to invite them. I seem to have departed very far from art. I come back with another remark. Visual expression, a brief image message in the 21st century have become a medium for communication and reflection more effective than long reads. Instagram definitely wins over academic journals in terms of audience numbers. And we need to include Ukrainian art and Ukraine in Ukrainian academical studies. Not only icons, Ilya Repin and his Cossacks, but also contemporary art. By the way, uh, last year in, pa in Paris, in the Petit Palais, uh, there was an exhibition called Repin, the Russian Soul prepared by specialists from the Tretikov Gallery, where, of course, the Ukrainian side of his biography and work was not touched. Olena Martinuk, who created the exhibition uh, Kiev's Art Revival uh, during the Perestroika yeah, in the Tsimerly Art Museum last year, and Alisa Loshkina, who wrote this uh, book 
permanent revolution are living and working in the United States right now. So they should be invited to give lecture on contemporary Ukrainian art invited by the art history department, by Barnard College, not only for the Ukrainian program. All of his discussion will only make sense if he who sits in Altai doesn't press the nuclear button. I think we all understand that today under the attack is not only Ukrainian studies, but also the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vita. So now we are moving on to uh, discussion uh, among the participants. Uh, does anybody want to ask questions of regarding your presentations that you've just done. Maybe I'll just make a comment on it uh, and on the field of Ukrainian studies, which makes it different, I would say, from many of the other national studies fields. And that is this period of movement and change and loss is not unique for Ukrainians but probably among most European societies, it is on uh, the most grievous and uh, I would argue uh, difficult part of the spectrum. Uh, and one of our tasks then becomes not only to break out to new fields, but to rediscover what was done already, which sometimes comes to us as a great shock and certainly to our, our colleagues in other such fields. I'll give an example from my own research, uh, working on Father Mikhailo Zubritsky, member of the Shevchenko Society, ethnographer. I, of course, found out that he sent ethnographic exhibitions to the Ethnographic Museum in Basel, to uh, Hoffman Kreier. Uh, contacting the museum in Basel, they found this rather strange, but being Swiss, they had carefully kept it all away and it was locked away. So from these 1912 contacts that are not we began, but uh, our predecessors in the field who had an opportunity to work out, one could renew that. Fortunately, he sent hundreds of exhibits to the Ethnographic Museum in Vienna. Uh, they were not as good as keeping all things as well as the Swiss, but they are there. And now I can contact colleagues in Ukraine to say, the paths to Europe by your predecessors are already there. It's a minor case of it, but I think there are many, many more we can find if we look for them. Uh, and uh, this, that it, how quickly things can be forgotten if you live in societies where there were mass destruction. And as we, I think with horror, think today, that we have no idea what is being destroyed and will be destroyed in Ukraine today and tomorrow. And all of those archives that were long closed that were now opened, when I think that the SBU uh, is going to come under bombardment, I can only dream that they have digitalized and hidden things appropriately because one can study in Ukraine or could study a few days ago, things one could not dream of studying in Russia where all the lock archives were now under lock and key. And so we, I think we've got a lot of things we have to do as a group for this. And, and many of these discussions of, of the art historians reminded me about this need to keep rediscovering as we move ahead as well. Thank you. Anybody would like to comment? I want to, to jump in and uh, bring my experience with um, uh, my um, attempt to create a common conversation around the Black Sea years ago. And the difficulties that I encountered on the ground um, because uh, precisely of this inertia, disciplinary inertia that I referred to in my introduction, um, it, is, um, it is very important for individual cultures to assert their own identity, but it is also very important for us to find frameworks within which we can uh, 
talk as Vita uh, gestured toward, uh, conversations that um, make individuals from national groups essential for understanding larger processes. Um, and um, pointing to parallel experience, which can enrich our understanding about this experience, are never easy. I um, had an event on uh, Armenian with the Armenian and Greek scholars about their experience of the genocide and the great tragedy, the, um, the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. The two groups didn't talk to one another, they talked within themselves. Um, and um, so the way uh, it is very important for Ukrainian studies to uh, assert its own identity or reassert its own identity under attack, but it is also very important to keep the conversations or to launch conversations across uh, divides across national lines in order to assert the transnational significance of processes that happened on the territory of Ukraine and with the participation of Ukrainian actors. Um, so one last example uh, from a project that um, I don't know how to reframe right now. Uh, so we, I have been pushing for years for the study of the refugees from the disintegrated Russian Empire in um, Constantinople in the early 20s. And the effect that writers and especially visual artists had on the Turkish metropolis and its culture. As it happens, most of these influential actors were not Russian. Uh, there are Ukrainians like Ryshenko and Ismailovich. There, um, there is a, a Georgian like Ilya Zinevich. There, um, so so it is a multi-ethnic, multinational, multilingual uh, group. Um, but um, there isn't a, an easy, transparent way by which we can label this so that it can be turned into an exhibition or a volume uh, so that it reaches audiences. And I'm just posing this as a, right now I have a solution, at least for the conference that we have in, in Istanbul in, in June, encounters Istanbul and the refugees from the former Russian empire, which is not very exciting, but it is accurate. Um, but we're planning a big exhibition in Para. How can we label this exhibition in a way that it is the reference to it is recognizable, legible to different audiences. They're all trained to see these refugees as white Russians, as Bayar Ruslar. Um, so this, this is an open question. I don't know the answer, but I thought that it, it's important to bring it to the table. I just want to add to this, and I want to thank Vita for her, her remarks and uh, Valentina just for yours as well. And I, I wanted to call attention to the, the, the question of, let's say, imperial chauvinism and the legacy of colonialism in places like Ukraine that we as scholars maybe didn't address more broadly beyond the field of Ukrainian studies as we should have done. The other thing is to um, address things like Ukraine fatigue, right, that term. Um, which is just intellectually quizzical. You don't hear about you know, France fatigue or England fatigue. Um, yeah, this is a term that I've heard used in a lot of analytical diplomatic contexts. And I think it speaks to a couple of things that also we have to address here. And the first is that, um, and, and Frank can speak to this much better than I can. Um, there is a tendency to um, study history, speak about history with references to, to states right, to top-down processes um, in which nations and states um, coalesce and collide. And I think that points to this broader question of a kind of intellectual laziness that has led uh, to, to many ignoring Ukraine, refusing to, to really study it closely, 
and, and that leads to the third thing, which is just the basic complexities um, in studying Ukraine. Um, it, it is not easy. Um, I do feel like that's something we can address practically. You know that um, we that with our industry, with our collaborations, we can um, uh, penetrate that complexity, make it interesting um, for students. But you know, I had a conversation this morning with a French journalist from Le Monde for about an hour, and it was basically a, a crash course, or I was trying uh, uh, to give a crash course. Um, in Ukrainian history, and she had questions about Rus, then she had questions about Little Russia, she had questions about the term Ukraine, uh, about the Hetmanates, about the, the role of um, uh, the Ukrainian Cossacks in, 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 um, in, in Russian history, as well as Ukrainian history. I mean, these are really um, conversations you cannot have in, in an hour. Um, and require, I think, a lot of method method methodological toolkits, a lot of approaches, um, lots of different kinds of texts, and as Valentina said, different reference points. So um, we have a number of fronts here that are challenging. Um, I'm more sanguine and have been very sanguine about the complexity issue because I do think that is, you know, something we can address um, through um, alerting students to the opportunities, scholars to the opportunities that Ukraine presents. But I'm more concerned about the lingering issues of that kind of intellectual laziness about histories and states, and in particular that colonial legacy um, that has consigned uh, Ukrainians and Ukraine to um, the back pages in certain circles. That has to end. I, I have to confess that, you know, there were certain moments after 2014 that I thought a lot was going to change in that respect, that the annexation of Crimea and then the invasion of Eastern Ukraine, which is abortive, right? It did not succeed. So there's been talk about Putin being a great strategist someone who wins in the battle space. But the, the case of Eastern Ukraine um, is an example of it not succeeding. Um, the, the attempt was to go much further into Eastern Ukraine and they were stopped by Ukrainians naturally defending their own territory in their own country. So um, those are just some of the areas that, that perhaps, um, at least for me, feel um, helpful to keep in mind as we approach this question. Thank you. Uh, any other comments before we move on to questions, Q&A? Uh, the first question I have, uh, this is to all the panelists, but perhaps mainly for Vita Sosak particularly. Uh, it's a question that's been troubling me. Is there now an urgent need to evacuate from Ukraine key cultural treasures, artworks, manuscripts from Ukraine temporarily? As my fear is that such works will be a key target for destruction by the Russian army. I can only imagine what they would do, for example, with the Shevchenko Museum in Cave in Kanyu. I appreciate the optics of this, but would not or would not be good, but would it be temporary and their loss would be irreplaceable? So uh, Vita and to others. Okay, other, <laughs> what question is, what can, what, how can I help? So of course I, I am in contact me with my colleagues in Kiev, but uh, the official position, I think that it's right, that they didn't, they don't answer where this uh, treasure collection is uh, are actually. So uh, you understand that nobody could imagine such uh, inv invasion. So, so so quickly, yeah. And you, you, you heard about this destruction of uh, Museum of Maria Primachenko. Uh, lately, we received an information that, uh, uh, fortunately, these uh, 25 works by Maria Primachenko are uh, survived. So, I, I cannot answer for this uh, question. But of course, uh, you know, when it, it was uh, happened, happened in this uh, Buddha statue in, in Pakistan, it was, it was so far for us. Yeah? Nobody could imagine that it, it, something similar can happen in the Christianity, the Christianity world. So it happened. And uh, uh, I can not answer uh, of all these archives are digitalized or not. I'm, I, I doubt that all is digitalized. Of course, it is some part, but not all. Uh, I hope that my colleagues, I, I trust them that they did what they could to preserve uh, our collection of uh, Ukrainian art of uh, historical documents. Uh, 
But, uh, you know, when uh, Chernobyl is in the hands of uh, Russian troops, and when this crazy person is in bunker in Altai, who can um, say what will wait, what is waiting for us tomorrow? So I, I cannot answer this question. And maybe just I'll just say a word on it because we may face this too. Uh, I think of my good friend Andras Riedelmeier that did fantastic work in trying to restore the collections of Sarajevo that uh, made a call to international scholars, anyone who had notes, anyone who had material to try to try and restore that. I hate to think in these terms, uh, but I think the one thing that has happened there has been somewhat improvement of interest in Ukraine by scholars who didn't want to really study Ukraine, but wanted to study the Soviet Union and could not get into Moscow and Petersburg archives and therefore have been going to Kiev recently as they've been going to the Baltic, but there's more material than Kiev and throughout Ukraine and have studied. I think of our Toronto scholar, Lynn Viola, who's written a, a fantastic works now uh, on the horrible periods of the 1930s, but they have worked in the, the, these archives and materials. And I fear that we may be soon be calling out to, to everyone who has anything digitalized. Uh, uh, let us hope not, but, but, but we gotta be ready for everything. Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, for all panel participants but especially in response to Professor Feenan's reference to Ukraine as a black hole, quote unquote, in the Western perspective. The post-Soviet sphere is full of black holes ranging from East European states to Central Asia. In viewing Russian studies and post-Soviet studies as academic fields that overlap and coincide with one another, what is the value in maintaining a post-Soviet perspective? Is the discipline too broad to bring forward new research and intellectual investigation in a meaningful way? Would it be better to re-envision the region along other lines? If so, what uh, would or could those lines be? So maybe Roar and, and, and anybody else that would like to, to answer. Yes, thanks very much for that comment. I couldn't agree more um, in speaking about um, and again, thinking more about general public awareness and knowledge of, let's say, Ukrainian culture and society, it did represent a kind of black hole, but it is not alone. So that's why I wanted to mention you know, Baltic studies, um, African studies, um, an entire continent that's very poorly known in any depth and detail, particularly in North America and the UK. Um, and the question that you ask about the value and currency of the term post-Soviet is a really good one. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued often how the term keeps being used, even though we're 30 years out and we're not speaking, let's say, about the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, but we're talking about it now as if it means something. Um, that said, you know, where is the connective tissue and should we find it? Um, I'm not so sure. Um, I think, if anything, um, what the circumstances after the dissolution of the Soviet Union reveal are various trajectories in which national identities um, accelerated in different ways or they were consolidated in different ways. And I think finding a vocabulary that allows us to speak of that diversity while still keeping it in a frame um, would be, I think, very useful. I think these are the kinds of issues we have to, to tackle. I don't have any easy answers now, but I really appreciate the, uh, the steer in this direction. Thank you, Rory. Does anybody else want to provide some opinion on this? Um, okay, next question. I am a Russian historian and director of the public history program at the College of Staten Island, SUNY. I am working on mobilizing the public history discipline to help Ukrainian studies and Ukraine. If you had a group of digital humanities scholars who could create public-facing public projects, which you will, what would you want them to do? Professor Susan Smith, Peter. Anybody? Okay. Yeah, if you could just, the end of it said public. Yes. If you had a group of digital humanities scholars who could create public facing projects, 
what would you want them to do? Okay, so I mean, obviously, one that that, that I was running, I, I brought up the whole of the Mar. Many people say uh, by now, if the North American public knew, knew one thing until this happened about Ukraine, it was the the whole of the Mar. Uh, but but I don't think those those things end. And above all, what was brought up earlier, that is in comparative perspective with other communities and groups, it certainly would be something that 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 uh, would be worthy of study and reaches a broad public because they're usually people who have some some at least glimmering that this occurred. Yeah. I, uh, if, can I hop in there quickly and just say that, uh, I mean, there are so many fascinating and stirring examples of um, relationships and projects for solidarity among various ethnic groups in the Ukrainian lands over the centuries and in the evolution of the Ukrainian national project, um, whether there are connections of solidarity between Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians, Jews and Ukrainians, um, offering, let's say, uh, exhibitions um, in this digital context that highlight those connections and highlight how successful they were, how powerful they were, um, particularly in the evolution of a political Ukraine, um, would be very stirring now as you're seeing people from all different walks of life, different languages, um, different religions, all of them coming together around an idea. And the idea of modern uh, Ukraine is one very much orientated to the question of universal democratic freedom. So these types of relationships of solidarity are fascinating. There's lots of material we could use from literature um, to um, uh, uh, diaries, etc. And then I th I'm sure Vita could talk a great deal about so many, she mentioned in her presentation, so many amazing um, Ukrainian artists that have been, uh, I think, forgotten and effaced from a lot of um, uh, our discussions. People like, you know, um, Sevalod Maximovich, uh, Alexander Bohomazov, or a few others. There's so much material there. Actually, this question is um, is remarkable because it just leads us to a plethora of different opportunities. We have too many of these things. Ukraine presents for scholars a a, um, a treasure trove of different things. Um, and I fear now, of course, in the in in the context of this war, we'll have, you know, many many more that we can't handle. Which is why, you know, institutions supporting Ukrainian scholars, finding studentships for uh, PhD candidates um, to study Ukraine are going to be very urgent going forward. Because frankly, we have too much work to do. Can I? Say okay. I just wanted to say that uh, we have been brainstorming in the last week uh, what to do here in the Harriman and there, um, I mean, we have a big faculty meeting tonight to finalize our program and it will become public next, uh, in the next couple of days. But one of the things that we have been thinking about is how to help back up um, digital repositories uh, from Ukraine uh, with critical scholarly content um, and so if there is a team of digital humanities specialists in Staten Island, uh, they're more than welcome to join forces with us because uh, it, these times require broad collaborations, not only in support of Ukrainian scholars, individuals, but also in support of uh, archives, um, collections, artifacts, and um, and we need to work together. Uh, it is not up to just the single institution to handle the enormous um, complex problem that we are facing. Peter, okay. I, I would like just mention this uh, project that exists uh, many years yet, a Ukrainian Jewish encounter. This is uh, from Canada, but so many interesting texts about Jews about Ukrainian and they, they are working, they organize a conference, they publish and you know they work working and they publish in our uh, internet site Zahidnet but regularly the information about Jews, a history of Jews in Ukraine. Uh, it's working when it's, it, the idea is good. People, people collaborate, people are working but people must be free. So this is the main condition. Uh, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, 
concerning what Valentino was speaking about earlier, uh, if I understood correctly. Uh, he writes, I took a course called the Russian short story. There were stories in the course from authors in the former Soviet Union, Central Asia, etc., countries that had their own languages, etc. In addition to Russian, where the authors wrote in Russian as well as their own languages, but the stories were presented as Russian short stories, minimizing the culture of the author's country. Uh, so that's a comment to what uh, Valentino was saying at, at earlier. Yeah, it's it's a perennial problem. Uh, a lot of our canonical Russian writers actually have been born or worked in uh, Ukraine. Um, some of them also wrote in Ukrainian, part of their works at least. Um, uh, but um, we, I think that it is very easy. Um, I don't remember who uh, Vita was saying that one way of homogenizing uh, the cultural production is by saying everything within the borders of the Russian empire is Russian. Um, another way is through language. Everybody who writes in Russian is a Russian writer and both are fallacies and they have to be unpacked um, and, and clarified uh, in, people don't like that because uh, it com complicates the picture and nobody likes complexities and it challenges people to learn what they don't know. And there's a resistance to that, but we have to do it. Um, and that will reshape, I think, not just uh, the way we do art history, but also the way we do literary history, the way we do musical history, we, the way we do cultural history more broadly. And can I just mention that I think, you know, th this has been left to Ukrainians too long. I think, hmm. um, you know, those of us who come to the field of Ukrainian studies without a Ukrainian background, it's, it's really incumbent on us to speak about a lot of these issues, um, to point out that they're just evidence of intellectual laziness, not national sentiment, not political sentiment. Um, I recall when the British Film Institute, an organization institution that I've worked with many times over the years, um, uh, had a film festival of Russian film pioneers, it was called, quote unquote. And the works of Alexander Dovzhenko um, uh, were basically half the program. And the, the tragedy of that is here in the UK, we have a word, British, that can sit and transcend above different national distinctions, Welsh, English, Scottish, et cetera. So the use of the term Soviet would have been pretty evident, but it wasn't chosen. And that leads us to not only the question of intellectual laziness, but also the legacy of Russian soft power um, and the investments that have been made over decades and centuries to promote events like this that actively co-opt um, individuals from what they would call the Russian world um, into a, a space that flattens their artistic expression, flattens their, their various identities. Um, what we've been doing in, in this, I think, respect is sometimes reducing so much diversity. And when we come to the study of contemporary Ukraine, you can see it in the US and the UK all the time. And that is that linguistic diversity is portrayed as linguistic adversity because we can't quite understand how a Ukrainian could be both Russian speaking and Ukrainian speaking. That naturally it must be two groups that don't see eye to eye when we're not actually acknowledging a very active bilingualism. So in, in the academic space, what we have to do is acknowledge a major failing that all of us I think would agree is central um, uh, to any academic endeavor is to take on board as Valentina just said, complexities but diversity and not flattening and reducing that diversity for the benefit of um, you know, an easier book to write. Um, that, that's, that's really the, the challenge that is, it cuts deep into what we do. And if we don't exercise this problem, um, it'll just come back to bite us in the future again. Can I add on this in a certain way, uh, the call, and I think it was uh, Vita in a way was, was aiming towards this, we can improve Russian imperial studies and Russian imperial history. People teach history of the Russian empire who have never read one word of Slavatsky or Mitskevich. Uh, 
people teach on cities in the Russian Empire, which would not have the faintest idea if we talked about Wuj. Uh, and yet they are viewed somehow in this comfort space. I mean, I remember saying to someone doing you know, Ru Russian culture, yes, the greatest poet of the Russian Empire, Mitskevich. And, you know, someone, well, he was not there all the time, but he was there part of the time and then developed somewhere else. So in a way, we've got a lot to offer. I mean, it's hard at this moment when we talk about the field of, of trying to change that. And earlier there was a talk that Russians have to get over the, the imperial legacy uh, in these smaller intellectual circles. But there's a way we can help them do it if we can only expand, get them to expand a bit the way they even con, uh, conceive of this. We had in history the turn towards the imperial, but the turn towards the imperial did not do uh, what uh, uh, Rory suggested they do. They, they rehabilitated in a certain way Russian imperial institutions identity uh, supposedly as a non-national formation, but then continued to, to teach and think entirely in Russian national terms. And if we can get them to rethink that, I think we'll be doing uh, all of academia a service. I, I would like just add small comparison. And this is uh, why it's so comfortable uh, to call all this space Russian world. As a student, a researcher uh, in West world, uh, they learned Russian and it was a key to come to Kiev, to Riga, to, to another uh, part of Soviet Union, when they could communicate, they could, could read in this language. It should be a, a great effort to learn another small language of small culture. And I have a comparison with Chinese word. It's so comfortable to, to use one adjective, Chinese. It's so it's asked so many efforts to understand what does it mean Uyghur, yeah, and all these problems is that are not yet covered. But it it comes uh, one time that the uh, word must to understand, must understand this. So, and I understand why it's so difficult to to live uh, so comfortable comfortable adjective Russian word. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions here. Uh, one, Ukraine is estimated to have had over 15 million people killed between 1914 and 1945. At least Tim Snyder revealed or exposed to the English language reader that between the early 30s and 1945, Ukraine was part of what he called the bloodlands. But again, how is it possible that the story of the 15 million killed all but escaped everyone's notice? And the second, a uh, related question. How can we explain that as late as 2017, perhaps the leading Sovietology in academe could write a more than 1000 page book about Stalin in which he dismisses the whole Demor with a wave of the hand and writes that quote, the famine was not intentional end quote. And that quote, there was no Ukrainian famine. The famine was Soviet. So how is it possible that the story of the 50 million killed all but escaped everybody's notice? And how is it possible um, to have written that uh, in this book about Stalin. Um, maybe I can just quickly try to a concise answer just to start off. But um, I think um, some of this is due to, let's say political ideology um, in the academic space itself, um, not wanting to call attention to right or left, but there have been um, ways in which um, let's say political end of the spectrum with which I identify has been loath to acknowledge um, national histories and communities um, and to acknowledge traumas that have occurred due to national discrimination and atrocities based on one's uh, uh, national identity. Um, and that's why I think, you know, coming to grips with the imperial frame and colonialism is really very important. Uh, particularly for those who are trained in um, the study of post-colonial cultures, you will see in the case of Ukraine so many synergies and connections um, that um, I think really point in important directions for cross-cultural understanding. But I suspect that some of it was 
Um, on the one hand, in terms of the blindness to 15 million innocent people caught between two totalitarian regimes was largely due to uh, the Soviet state, of course, of facing that suffering, deporting peoples um, who had been caught in the crossfire, labeling an entire occupied territory as um, a space with collaborators and the like. Um, that role of the state in fashioning a Soviet history in particular that a lot of scholars bought into wholesale is something I think we're still trying to deal with now. Yeah, if I, just on short, I mean, so academics should get the major complaints, but, but just to talk about media as well. MSNBC, listen, I listened to Joe Scarborough, and I think I've heard 10 times that we have to understand that Russia lost 27 million people in World War II. 27 million Russians died in World War II. This is someone who is in generally pro-Ukrainian uh, and sitting next to Mika Brzezinski, who you think might be able to jump in and say it's a little more complex. But if that then occurs in a commentator on media, it also tells us something about it. And I, I think it's largely, of course, you ha what we should propose is that people think in various spatial terms. And just as specialists in Ukrainian studies have to think at times in all imperial, Russian imperial terms and all Soviet terms, and we don't always, even in my Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and studying the Ukrainian lands, uh, I know that we have to move Ukrainian scholars of the 17th century also to think of the Commonwealth as a whole. That's the challenge of, 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 of how we can develop new, th new thinking on it. And that has not been done done above all appropriately. So the 15 million are missed because people did not think of it in that, those terms, those territories. Uh, the thousand page book is of course a, a matter of an individual scholar and choice. And the only hope is that there are enough people studying the period and by now a very, I think, well-established literature on, on the Holodomor or the Ukrainian famine uh, that there will be others who will then question it. Uh, but you know, when we're dealing with individual scholars, I mean, that's what we're all about. We write what we write and then have to put it to the test of the criticism uh, of, our, of our academic colleagues. Okay. Uh, well, we're almost running out of time, so I will just bundle these uh, two questions uh, so we can get to them. Uh, a comment is, we need to decentralize Russian studies as such and stop seeing the whole former Tsarist and Soviet empires in Russian eyes. For most case, this is a big academic problem. And then I am curious to know if you can elaborate on the similarities between what's happening in Ukraine now and what took place in Georgia in 2008. Somebody like to take that on? We have about three minutes left. So the need to decentralize Russian studies as such and, and stop seeing the whole former Tsarist and Soviet empire in Russian eyes and then Georgia 2008 and today. I can take the first part quickly. Um, it is, uh, yes, the decentralization of Slavic studies uh, is very important. We have to remember uh, that Slavic studies as a field developed as a, I always say, a legitimate child of German uh, idealism and Russian imperialism. And it's, we, the, these seeds of, planted in the field then acquired a particular form during the Cold War, especially in the West. Um, so um, the inertia in that direction of homogenizing everything as, as Russian is very strong, um, but uh, our efforts should be directed also toward understanding the historical logic behind these um, generalizations and easy labels. And um, that is, I believe, knowledge is a weapon in resisting them. Thank you. I would also just add that, uh, you know, we have concepts of Englishes, right? Um, we should do the same with Russian. The Ukrainian writer Andrei Korkov has been very eloquent in this respect to not think of the Russian language and Russian culture as 
um, uh, the, the property effectively of the Russian Federation. That's very important. And as far as the connections to, to Georgia in 2008, something that obviously the West should have paid much more attention to uh, for a lot of reasons. The one thing I would say is um, that conflict with Georgia never had what I would say is an ethnocidal element. That is, um, as Vita was putting it earlier with respect to Putin's own claims, um, of Russians and Ukrainians being a single people, one people. Um, that is a uh, striking and very frightening assertion that we're now seeing um, playing out in, um, in, in the lives of, of real people in terrible and horrific ways. So that wasn't um, present in the context of the Georgian crisis. Um, that should send shivers um, up our backs um, when we think about the legacy of the Second World War and what's going on now, even though we're not um, uh, comfortable making analogies to um, the Second World War and to Nazi Germany, we've got to be clear-eyed about what uh, Putin is saying about the U Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian state. Maybe I'll just add one thing. Uh, differences of the two are also the attitudes of the Russian Orthodox Church. Although the 19th century church couldn't get really deal with the Georgian Orthodox Church tradition. The Soviet Union did come to terms with the Georgian Orthodoxy. And I think if you look at the New York Times this morning, uh, Andrew Kramer has an article of, about the Caves Monastery and the, the concepts of those in the church involved who uh, still have to insist the Russian world concept. So Georgia could be subsidiarily into a Russian world still be an orthodox people and dealing with a certain tradition that still is rejected in too many circles within the Russian Orthodox Church, which Putin is both instrumentalizing to a degree, but I'm not willing to say is not also, does not also, whatever we're going to say, believe this. And I think too many people chose not to believe that Putin was really saying it was real. And we're looking for real explanations beneath this. Sometimes I think we have to take the text for its value and uh, maybe that's what is meant. Thank you. Uh, well, we are out of time today. Um, I, I do want to thank all the panelists uh, for for a wonderful discussion. I, let's hope this is uh, a major step in in in, in reevaluating the field and 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 working to 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 protect Ukraine studies. Um, and I want to also thank uh, people for listening in and submitting questions uh, to add to our discussion. Um, Please stay tuned. Uh, as Valentina mentioned, we're working on uh, much, much programming dealing with um, Russians of Asia of Ukraine and how it's affecting our field and the, the world in general. So thank you again. And, and if we didn't answer all the questions, you can send them to Marco and we can uh, communicate with you in other ways. And I hope that this conversation continues in another form later. Um, Colombia or elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you.